I'm Jerry Shively, Associate Dean in the College of Agriculture at Purdue University and Director of International Programs in Agriculture. Today, we're going to be watching a pre-recorded conversation on international research at Purdue. All right, thank you all for joining us today. We're going to add to International Week Activities 2020 in the College of Agriculture at Purdue University by having a conversation with three members of uh, IPIA's faculty advisory board, all individuals with a lot of depth and breadth of experience in international activities and research. I have with me Paul Ebner, professional, professor of animal sciences. Uh, Paul, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank Amanda you. Deering, clinical associate professor in food science. Thanks, Amanda. And Brian Pijanowski, who's a professor of landscape and soundscape ecology in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. Thanks for joining us, Brian. Uh, so our conversation today is gonna kind of center on three questions um, related to how international activities kind of get started and, and how they progress, some of the highlights from international work and, and also uh, getting some sense of where everyone sees international work uh, going in the, the near future. So I'd like to start with you, Paul, and maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how you got started with international work, um, how your research has evolved. Sure, so um, prior to coming to Purdue, I was involved in some different international programs. And then, you know, you go through graduate school and there's not, in most programs, there's not a lot of opportunity for international work, unless it's specifically that's your research. And then when I came to Purdue, uh, I, we started a study abroad program, and that was kind of a, kind of a gateway um, to doing other things. And that kind of grew into projects that were mostly would I would I'd, you know call them engagement programs or development programs. And then it turns into you know research on the engagement. You know how effective it is if you're introducing some new. Um, technology or even some new teaching strategy, how effective it is. And now we have research programs that are, they're based in that, that country um, and they're usually focused on some sort of challenge or issue that's, that's in that country. So that's kind of how it's progressed. Um, where, where, was it that, where was it that that first experience took place? Uh, my first experience was actually in college. I did a, uh, the college I went to had, um, uh, study abroad was part of the curriculum. So I spent my junior year in Japan. And then mm -hmm. after college, I was in the Peace Corps in Paraguay for uh, about two and a half years. And that, and that first experience at Purdue, was that something that you, you sort of joined with someone else? Uh, um, I had a partner, I partnered with uh, Mark Russell Mm -hmm. um, from in education now. And, yeah. uh, we had, he had a, a previous course that this is a course that took place in Romania and he had a previous course and, and we developed a new course that had a different focus. So it had a service learning focus, um, and where it grew to where the students, um, they weren't, they're not traveling around, not seeing a lot of sites. They could see some sites, but mostly it's working in these villages on, on issues or challenges that the village may have um, related to animal sciences. So we did a lot of work with um, milk quality and seeing, uh, trying to answer questions of whether this, this community, this group of farmers, what were the barriers to their joining forces and, and, and selling milk in bulk? Um, you know, what quality issues will they have? What will they have to overcome to make that feasible? Interesting. Uh, maybe a turn to Amanda. Um, Amanda, tell us a little bit about how you got started with international work um, and, and some of the things that you've done at, here at Purdue. Yeah, so I guess my story is a little bit different than Paul. I didn't, coming before Purdue, didn't have a lot of international experience. You know, went to a few places, but not, not doing international work. 
Um, and then I was approached. So Haley Oliver worked with, um, she's a professor in food science. Um, she worked with Kevin McNamara, who is, he is now retired and he was from Ag Econ. And they were working in Afghanistan. And she asked, you know, would I be interested in doing this food safety thing? So you kind of have somebody who has very little international experience and why not just start right out in Afghanistan? Right in Afghanistan. <laughs> that makes sense, right? <laughs> So I said, yeah, why not, you know, just give it a whirl. And, you know, I, I, I guess I probably picked one of the more difficult places to start out. And in some ways, looking back, it, it's made my whole international experience a lot different. Like, I look at things much differently. So when working in these other countries, I, um, so I did doing food safety work in uh, Afghanistan, and then that's translated into doing similar work in the food safety realm. Mostly what I do is work with growers teaching good agricultural practices and trying to help them move their products towards exportation. They, they're not, a lot of them aren't there to export anything, but working towards that goal. So now I've worked in Tajikistan. We have a project currently there and I have a project also in Peru. So now I think I, after the many years I was in Afghanistan, uh, the visits I made, I think working in a lot of other places, it seems much easier because as a woman in Afghan, working in Afghanistan is not the easiest thing to do. So um, it's made my experience easier. Yeah, I can, I can appreciate the, the challenges of working in Afghanistan. Uh, Brian, um, maybe you could share <laughs> sort of how your international work got started uh, I think you have a really interesting portfolio of activities. Yeah, so um, uh, my international work just kind of started suddenly one day. <laughs> so uh, a little bit of a backstory here. So uh, throughout my entire education, I didn't do any international work. No, no international study abroad opportunities were, were really there for me. Uh, four years after uh, receiving my PhD, I was hired on as the assistant to the deans in the College of Natural Science at Michigan State, and um, and and that that position was kind of very fuzzily kind of defined. I can probably do just about anything. The dean said uh, about six days after I got hired, uh, the dean came to me and said, "I just got beat up by our provost. Our study abroad numbers are at seven percent. She wants them at twenty percent." fast. So guess what? You now have a new job definition. So I got shipped over to <clears throat> the international programs office and I started rolling up my sleeves. And the first thing I knew is I was stepping on a plane going down to Ecuador, Quito, Quito, Ecuador, to visit with some of our students that were uh, on a study abroad program. I started interviewing the students and I asked them how valuable of an experience it was and they said it was life-changing, was transformative. It was really shaping their entire understanding of the world, both from a social standpoint and both from an ecological standpoint. And they were telling me how excited they were about going to the Galapagos Islands and Tipitini out in the Amazon. And I thought, wow, what an experience. So I came back and started working with other administrators to develop study abroad programs in Australia, in China, <clears throat> in South America. And I'll tell you, that was just really, uh, it, it, it started my career in research as well because I started writing grant proposals with other faculty. Uh, the first one that we hit was from the Department of Justice where we were looking at environmental justice issues in Japan. And I went uh, to Japan and went to, to uh, Toyama City uh, all by myself. It was just an incredible experience, but it was one of the most memorable <clears throat> experiences of my life when I met uh, one 86 year old woman who was inflicted with the Italia Italia disease and she grabbed my hand and she said, I am so thankful we're friends now. And I said, what do you mean by that? She says, as a child, I was in the city and the bombs from uh, the US planes were hitting all around me and now we're friends. I'm so glad we're friends. And she started crying and I started crying too. It was just one of those emotional experiences of connecting to another person around the world. Well, that's, uh, that's definitely a, a life-changing experience and, and a highlight, it would seem, 
maybe maybe I'd like to kind of follow on that theme and and talk a little bit about some of the highlights and some of the really kind of memorable experiences that you've all had as part of your international activities. Maybe we'll start start with you, Amanda. Um, yeah, I mean, highlights, I guess, you know, the reason why I keep keep going back is that I like working with the people. And when you work in these countries and they're so appreciative of, you know, they'll attend a workshop and it's thank you, thank you. You know, and they'll follow up with emails and, you know, that's why I keep going back. It's always the people. And even in Afghanistan, you know, when things, it's challenging to work in those areas. Again, that was, that's what kept me going back again and again. Paul, some, some highlights or memorable experiences? Highlights that we can talk about here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, everything's been a highlight. It's, it's an opportunity to work with different groups of people. It's an opportunity to kind of learn histories of uh, different places and how that shapes um, maybe how people make decisions or, or what, what's possible and what's, what can be a challenge. So I think it's all, it's, it's actually not, <clears throat> I tell people it's not dissimilar to what you're doing in the United States. It's just uh, a kind of a different context, but it's a new exciting context because it's new. And it is a, it is something you haven't experienced before, and you, or a culture, or a language, or um, um, a government system, and sometimes. Um, so all of those are highlights, you know. Just just being able to work with with different groups of people, um, yeah, it's it's always a joy. Yeah, I I mean I I certainly find for myself that each new place where I work causes me to sort of think carefully about the, the assumptions and preconceived notions that I bring to both my research and just my interactions with other people and sort of the cultural baggage that, that I'm carrying. Uh, and, and working in different places is a really great way to grow personally, I think, and to think, think about your, your, your own biases and your own um, maybe misunderstandings in, in some cases. Um, yeah, I think when, when you know, we always think about it in reciprocity, you know, it's not a, it's not a one way learning street where we're just dropping off information. Um, uh, we, we take away equally as much, you know, so it's, uh, and, and it's, but it's like you said, it's just extending yourself a little bit. You know, if you know if you haven't been out of this area, you go a little bit farther. You go a little bit farther. Some of them are just mile-wise or kilometer-wise, they're really far away. Mm -hmm. But it's the same idea. Do you have other, Brian? Do you have other yeah. highlights? I, and yeah, I I, I I do. I've I've got two that I'd like to share with you. And uh, one uh, was really <clears throat> the first research experience that I ever had internationally. And that was uh, a National Science Foundation project to uh, focus on climate change and food security in East Africa. And so I found myself uh, with a group of, of scientists from the US and the UK um, sitting underneath a fig tree, uh, listening to, to Maasai tell us about how they are adopting to climate change. And the backdrop was Mount Kilimanjaro. And it, it really doesn't get any better than that. I, I, I have a photo of me sitting there under the tree. Of course, I, I have hair. I'm a lot younger than I am right now. But I always tell that story to students that um, I was listening and learning uh, ab about life ways and, and the ways in which people were really struggling with climate change. Uh, actually years before, you know, uh, many of us were, were thinking about it because they are dealing with it on a daily to day basis. And so that was really an incredible experience for me. Uh, another one that I like to tell is, is my uh, research on soundscapes in Borneo, in Brunei. Uh, it took me about seven days to get to a very remote research station. Uh, it was planes, trains, automobiles, and boats, really, to kind of get me to this place. But I learned that in, in, in the back 
really deep woods of this tropical rainforest was this tower that you could climb to get to the very top of the, of the rainforest. And I, I went there with my colleague uh, one morning on the dawn course and the sun coming up, burning uh, the mist off the trees and listening to the gibbons uh, bark back and forth across. It was just an amazing experience. And he, t he asked me what, what I thought. And I said, you know what, I need to come back. And he says, okay, I'll come back with you. And I said, no, I, I have to come back alone. And he says, well, what is it that you want to do? And I says, I want to spend the night in this tower and listen. And that's what I did. I listened. And, and the story is that, you know, as I listened and listened deeply, I heard the wetlands of the Midwest at the top of the rainforest at night. And it started me as an ecologist to, to connect the dots. It was like, well, why is it that the top of the rainforest here sounds like the bottom of the forest in the Midwest? And as an ecologist, I started putting pieces together. It made me think more deeply about this planet. Really interesting. I, you know, the thing that's, that, um, that surprises me to some extent here, but maybe doesn't surprise me entirely is that um, although each of you have has made you know, really important uh, research discoveries, really important um, contributions to programs and activities uh, around the world. Uh, when I ask you to talk about your sort of highlights, almost uniformly, you talk about kind of personal experiences that, um, that kind of resonate. And I think that's a, a really um, interesting interesting observation. So um, of course, we're, we're living now in challenging times because with a, with a global pandemic, it's placed some constraints on what we're able to do and how we're able to operate, especially in the international space. Um, but I, I like to think that, you know, there's just, we've hit the pause button and that um, eventually we're going to resume something closer to uh, normal activities or activities as they used to be. As the three of you kind of look um, into the next few years of your own work, uh, where do you see your international work going? Where do you see the opportunities? How do you, um, how do you see the, the landscape for international research and international activities uh, changing and evolving? Maybe we'll start in this case with you, Brian. Yeah, um, for me, it's important to get students abroad and to do it as early as possible. So, I mean, that's that's where I'm focusing on because these experiences have been so deep and meaningful for me. I, I want to be able to have the next generation of thinkers and scholars to have the same kinds of experiences. Um, what I'm trying to do uh, with the, the students that I work with is is to focus on both the science and the adventure and combining them both uh, because it, it, it is kind of an uplifting experience to be able to go to places and think about uh, science. Uh, but you know, to do it the way that I need to do it as an ecologist, I need to get to places that are remote, that are really wild. And so that's where the adventure comes in. And, and uh, it, it really does get students thinking about this uh, as kind of a, you know, a career path really that's where they're starting rather than me jumping in and all, all of a sudden, you know, I have to hop on a plane in two weeks and, and there, there goes my career. It's on a completely different trajectory. Yeah. Paul, um, turn to you. Yeah, I think um, a lot of what we focus now on, <clears throat> we, I mean, we have projects that are just research projects. Like we have a project with Pakistan where it's, three universities together and it's we're doing the research together but in other cases it's um there's opportunities to use research um as kind of the the learning event so in most of these countries they have challenges and that a lot of them can be solved by research we just happen to have more experience with it and you know we can we can help that that process along. And sometimes it's as simple as like you know we're going to focus on statistics and experimental design. Um, sometimes it's broader. You know, let's try and connect the university better with um, people and users of this research. Um, but the goal is always that you know you can use this research. You, research projects are awesome experiential learning 
um, platforms. But you use that, and the goal is is not all. It's not just to complete this research, but to do it in a way that those involved in the research can use those techniques and those methods well beyond the scope of this current research to to address you know emerging problems. So I think that's like something you know we're not you know coming from Purdue we're not necessarily um, better at it. We've just been maybe doing it for a longer period of time. And we can use that experience to say, you know, these are groups that want to get better at this. They want to develop these research programs and we can rely on that experience and say, well, this is, this is what we've done. This is how it's worked. Um, this is how it hasn't worked. These are the challenges, things like that. But the goal is to, you know, to where these labs or these institutions can then apply all of that learning well beyond this, this smaller research project itself. Yeah, great. Amanda, maybe we'll let you have the last word on this, this topic. As you look into the future, what, what do you see for your own work and for, for international activities more generally? And I think I would, I'd go along with Paul. Um, I think the projects that I've enjoyed working on the most is where we really focus on capacity building. And that can be in any aspect. You know, it's whether it's getting them better at doing research or you know, growing crops or getting producing these crops into value added products, all these things are building capacity. And I think that's the most important thing. I mean, it's, it's one thing for us to go in and change something quickly, but if you don't teach people how to do it, that's not gonna be sustained. And so I can see myself continuing in that, in that space. Um, it seems like, the countries I work in just kind of happen <laughs> for the most part. And sometimes I actually have to look at a map and find out where these countries are, which though, but that's, that's kind of the fun part too. You know, so I, I, I haven't, I can see myself doing any of working in any of these countries, as long as we still focus on capacity building and making the lives better for the people. And, and that includes, like I said, research or all these other different aspects. Yeah. You know, I have to say that, you know, one of the joys of working at Purdue in the College of Agriculture is this kind of uh, spirit that each of you presents and represents the, not just the can-do attitude, but the caring attitude and the thoughtfulness that you bring to your work every day. Um, so I, I really appreciate that and I, I thank you. Um, just to, to wrap up, I want to thank my, my three panelists, Paul Ebner, Professor of Animal Science, uh, Amanda Deering, Clinical Associate Professor of Food Science, and Brian Pijanowski, the Professor of Landscape and Soundscape Ecology in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. Thank you all three for your time today and for your sharing your experiences. I'm Jerry Shively, Director of International Programs in Agriculture at Purdue. And uh, thank you for your attention and for joining us.